So uh, today's Pentecost. Yeah, cu- hold your applause, slow down, keep it down. I know, right? That means that uh, roughly 3,312 years ago today was the first Pentecost. It took place 50 days after God led the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt. He brought them to the base of Mount Sinai and gave them the Torah. That was the first Passover, or the first, 50 days after the first Passover was the first Pentecost. Roughly 1,300 years later, or about 2,012 years ago, God sent his spirit on that same day. The same spirit that was inside Jesus Christ to dwell in the hearts of those who called on him for salvation. Never before had God's spirit been universally accessible to all mankind. Acts chapter 2 tells the story. I'll just give you the intro. When the feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks. God, I pray that this morning you would spread through this place like a wildfire. So let's try this again. Today we celebrate the revelation of God's word and the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. Today is Pentecost. It's a little better. All right. Well, it's Pentecost. I shared the two big Pentecost stories with you. I referenced the Old Testament and the New Testament, brought it all together and got applause at the end. Y'all have a nice Sunday. <laughs> right? I mean, what a... Two minutes and two minutes in, maybe I should have taken a little more time on that. I might have rushed that a bit. Yeah, this is going to get awkward, isn't it? Okay, so there's another Pentecost story in the Bible. There's uh, one other one. And what's cool is I didn't know this was a Pentecost story when I picked the text for this sermon. And I also didn't know that I would be preaching on Pentecost. So how cool is that? Man, so all of a sudden I'm preaching on Pentecost, a Pentecost story. It's as if God knows what he's doing. It's incredible. Now this Pentecost story doesn't get nearly the fanfare that the other two get. And in fact, I had to do a little math even to figure out that it is a Pentecost story. Um... One year before that day when the Holy Spirit came down like a wildfire on that room, exactly one year before that, uh, the disciples were walking with Jesus, and um, John tells the story like this. Soon after, another feast came around, which, if you do the math, turns out to be Pentecost, and Jesus was back in Jerusalem. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there was a in Hebrew called Bethesda. With five alcoves, hundreds of sick people, blind, crippled, paralyzed, were in these alcoves. One man had been an invalid there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him stretched out by the pool and knew how long he had been there, he said, Do you want to be well? The sick man said, Sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. By the time I get there, someone else is already in. Jesus said, get up, take your bedroll, start walking. The man was healed on the spot, picked up his bedroll, and walked off. Now the story of Bethesda, it's a real place um, in Jerusalem. You can still go to the ruins of the Pool of Bethesda today. Uh, You just go into the old city and up and to the right if you're heading there this afternoon. Uh, You can't miss it. Big sign, Bethesda, kind of like ours out here. Anyway, um, and then, and there's all these just like, they're like rooms without doors or, or ceilings on them. They're alcoves, and, and you can see all of those today. But imagine um, the scene back on this day. Imagine yourself walking into this, the stone structure, so everything's really echoey. And you look around, and there are just hundreds of people 
missing limbs, misfigured limbs, blind, deaf, lame in any way a person can be lame. Okay, so there probably weren't any like dorks there. But lame in every other way that a person can be lame. Can you just imagine the noise and the smell and the, and, and you're there with Jesus, this guy's been known to heal a few people. And all of a sudden, out of all of these hundreds of people, Jesus notices a guy, and in my head, he was in like the back left corner. He's like hanging out by Joel over there somewhere. And uh, he's in the back left corner, and Jesus picks out this one guy out of hundreds and, and says, do you want to be well? Now, the pool of Bethesda, uh, legend had it that once a day, an angel would come down from heaven and stir the pool. And if you were the first one in, then you would be healed. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Belvedere Pool. Have you guys ever been there before? Yeah, during rest period. And, you know, it's been rest period for 14 minutes, and all the kids are, like, the edge of the pool. They're, like, just itching to get in, right? And the lifeguard blows the whistle, and they all just jump for it, and they're in the pool. Like, so I picture it kind of like that, but lots of people, like, missing limbs and stuff, kind of, like, falling over each other. It's a terrible scene, I know, but it's, it's reality, people. It's not a children's story. <laughs> if you're laughing, shame on you. <laughs> it's supposed to be a sad picture, not a funny one. Um, and so, so that's why all these people were there uh, in these alcoves, because they had heard this story. And that's a weird story and a weird thing to believe in, but apparently a lot of people bought in. Um, so the God of the universe chooses this one guy, and he gets down, I picture him getting down here face-to-face -face level with the guy, reach out his hand, and says, do you want to be well? Why would he ask that? I mean, isn't the answer, duh? Uh, I don't think you can duh the Savior of the world. I don't think that's allowed. Um, but that seems like the answer, right? The most appropriate answer. Of course he'd want to be well. Why would he why would he even ask that question? And so, while I may not understand the question, the answer that the guy gave, I get completely. I've heard this answer before. The guy, the man who was lame, you know, he said, well, God, Jesus, you see, there's a certain procedure that you have to follow to be healed around here. There's a certain belief structure that you've got to fall into. Um, we have rules on how this sort of thing happens. Uh, you know, there's got to be a, me a meeting and, and a query, query? No, a quorum must be met, minutes must be taken. There's a process for getting well around here, Jesus. Get with the game. I can't just be well because I want to be well. What are you thinking? I've heard that one before, I think. And Jesus doesn't justify. He doesn't say, oh, you're terrible and here's who I am and here's who you are. He just says, get up, take your bedroll and get walking. Just that simple. Bethesda Covenant Church, do you want to be well? I'm asking you a question. Then get up and start walking. Not literally right this second. Stay till the end of the sermon. Sometimes people get really fired up, and they're like, oh, I'm in! And then I'm like, oh, come back. Um, but it's so, so easy to stay lame, isn't it? I mean, the guy had been at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. All his friends were there. They weren't doing nothing. They weren't getting up. They weren't changing the world in any way, right? He had his spot over there in the corner, and the stone was worn away just perfectly to the shape of his butt. Um, if you were looking for Joe the invalid, you simply went to the pool of Bethesda, back left corner, and that's where you found him. That was his spot. He was comfortable. He knew how to be that guy. He knew how to be lame, laying on a bedroll in the corner at the pool, hanging out all day. He knew how to do that. That was his thing. He was a professional. I'm guessing because Jesus went up to this guy and the Bible quotes how long he had been there that this might have been the guy who was there the longest. So if there's any sort of lame pecking order 
uh, this guy was at the top of the chain here. Um, why he couldn't find his way into the pool, I think might have been a little bit because he didn't want to, but that's just in my opinion. It's so easy to stay lame. Today it sounds kind of like this. We hear about something that another church is doing. You hear, you know, you go and you visit another church somewhere or your cousin goes to this church or you hear about another church in town and you hear about a program that they have going on where let's say they're feeding the hungry, like just hundreds of hungry people are being fed and you say to your friend, now why doesn't our church do something like that? Now, how come Bethesda can't be the kind of church that does those kinds of things? You say, I wish I was part of the kind of church that did that. Yeah, me too. I too would like to be part of the kind of church that does that. If you want to be well, you have to get up and start walking. You, you have, you, 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 you have to get up and start walking. You have to make a difference. And you know what's incredible? If you invite another person in this room to come with you to make a difference, what's going on there? Your church is making a difference. Suddenly you're part of a church that's doing that very thing that you are so passionate about. <gasps> that's incredible. How quickly that happened, isn't it? In uh, pastoral circles and leadership meetings and whatnot, we call the kind of church that is spiritually well a healthy, missional church. And it is the kind of church that myself, all the rest of the staff, the leadership, everyone else involved here at Bethesda Covenant Church is desperately trying to be. We want to be that church. Do you want to be a part of a church that feeds the hungry. Do you want to be a part of a church that feeds the hungry? Then go find some hungry people and give them some food. It's really easy. And bring a friend along. It not only makes it more comfortable and more fun, it's also then becomes, Jesus said, we're two or more gathered in my name. I am there in their midst. Therefore, if you and your friend go and do this, your church has now fed the hungry. And then maybe next time, two more friends. And, and then maybe some people over here will get the same idea and go do this thing over here. Suddenly your church is making an impact. And suddenly all the other churches and people and stuff are going, huh, why doesn't our church do something like that? <laughs> because you're the church and you're not doing it. It doesn't require much time. It doesn't require any money, really. It certainly does not require an official program. No meetings need to happen, no minutes need be taken, no quorum met, no official document signed in triplicate by the entire pastoral staff. None of these things are required for the church to make a difference in this community, for this church to be well, for it to be healthy and missional. It simply takes a desire in us, individually, to be well, to decide to live a healthy, missional life. And I guess at a high level, that sounds good to everyone. But functionally, it seems people get stuck. They say, oh, I want to make a difference, but I just don't know how. Okay, so you know that uh, intersection of state and uh, 251, where there's the no soliciting sign, and there's always people out with the, with the cardboard sign soliciting, will work for food, that sort of thing? There's a big rock there. So when I see someone out there and I have 15 minutes to burn, what I do is I just drive around to the Burger King, I get two lunches, walk over, and I sit on the rock with the homeless guy and have lunch. Um, sometimes I'll hold the sign while he eats so that way he can take the time, you know, but he's still getting the donations in. Um, yeah, if you see me out there, don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's not what you think. Um, so, you know, what, whatever. I, this way I'm feeding a hungry person and I'm getting to know the guy, build a relationship. Next time I see him, he'll recognize me, those sorts of things. Um, that's, that's awesome. Do that. And if, you take, if I take someone, and every time I take someone with me to do that, our church is then doing that. Do you understand? 
The church is now feeding the hungry, meeting the lost, making friends with the homeless. I understand that having a picnic with a homeless guy is not all of your guys' style. No judgment here. That's fine. Um, but what you can do is take, your, take an empty cardboard box, go to your cupboards, which are probably pretty full, and do one of these motions into the box, and take that box to one of a number of wonderful organizations we have in this city that are feeding the hungry. You can go to Carpenter's Place, Love, Inc., Rock House Kids, Salvation Army. The list goes on and on and on. Show up with your box. You're going to feel really awkward, but it's, your awkwardness is going to melt away when the person that you set the box goes, gets that light in their eye. They're so excited that you're there. And you say, I hear you feed hungry people. Here's some food for that. They will thank you profusely. They won't be like, oh, weirdo, what are you doing here with food? It's not going to happen, okay? There won't be any judgments. They'll be very excited that you're there. And then say the words, is there anything else I could help with around here? And then when they give you the list, because they have the list, they're going to be like, yes, here's a 22-point list of things you could help with around here. They have that on hand. Trust me, there's a shortage of people willing to help. And when they give you that list and you go to do those things, take someone with you and know that you are part of a church that is then making a difference because you and someone from your church together are making a difference. If you've got lots of money, give it to the poor. I don't mean all of it. I just, just give them some. There's people with nothing. Give them some money. I know, I know, never give homeless people money. They're just going to spend it on dr drugs and alcohol and tobacco and whatever. Bye. Carry Logley's cards around with you and give Logley's cards to people in need. I don't care how you do it. God says to be generous. He didn't tell you to judge wh where your generosity gets used. Um, if you can cut hair, go southwest of here to any park, put up a sign that says free haircuts, and watch as the neighborhood kids come flocking to you. And, and the mamas come in with their kids. You really giving free haircuts? I've seen this happen. It's beautiful. They are so thankful that you're giving free haircuts. All you need to know how to use is a buzzer. It's not, no one's picky. Um, if you have a guitar and you know how to sing, just go to a poor neighborhood and sing kids songs. And they all just gather around you and sing. It's like when Jesus sat down and all the kids came to him. You'll feel awesome. And all you'll have done is given up a half an hour worth of playing guitar. It's not difficult to make a huge impact. It doesn't take a huge budget. It is kind of scary, though, at first. Like that initial, like, really? I'm going to make my own cardboard sign that says free haircuts and just stand there with it? Yeah, it's weird, I know, and totally uncomfortable at first. But after you do it once, you will be addicted because helping people is, oh, it's so great. It's how you be, it's, it's the definition of well. So because it's embarrassing and it's scary and because sometimes it takes up time from your personal time, um, who gave you that time in the first place is always my question, but anyway. Um, so because of all of the things that are involved with doing this, I think that's why Jesus gets down face to face, looks us in the eye, and says, do you want to be well? I think that's where that question comes from. Like, this guy wasn't going to be able to just hang out in the corner at the pool anymore. There's a cost to being well. You've got to get up. You've got to get uncomfortable and walk. I'm not naive and I'm not trying to fool anyone. There is a cost here. There is a cost to being well. And, and what it's going to cost our church is some comfort. I know, I know. You guys, it's possible that you're going to walk in here on a Sunday morning in the future. And in your pew, in your very seat, there may be a homeless person sitting there. Now, he doesn't realize that you've been sitting there for 38 years and that the pew cushion is worn just exactly to the shape of your butt. 
he or she is not aware that that's what's going on here, but it may happen. If the prayers that I'm praying become answered, it will happen. You may, in fact, have to reach past a boy wearing girls' clothes when you go to get the lid for your coffee on Sunday morning. Right here at Bethesda, it could happen. If the church is well, if Bethesda Covenant Church is well, then it will be filled with the sick. That is what a healthy missional church looks like. It looks like a church that is filled with the sick, the lost, the grieving, the confused, the disillusioned. They all need to know that they have a home here. It will cost us all some comfort. The coffee area might not smell as nice before service. Our church retreat pictures might not look so white. Um, this is going, there will be a cost. And for some, I know, unfortunately, it breaks my heart, but I know that for some, the cost will be too much to bear. Some will drive by in their cars and say, that used to be such a nice place at Bethesda. It's too bad they let those people take over. It's too bad they got overrun by those people. Oh, it's just too bad. Maybe you'll recall that they used to have this youth pastor. What was his name? You know, the one who used, used to let the neighborhood kids run wild around the church, leaving a terrible mess in their wake. Never seemed to clean it up. And you know what? I don't think any one of those parents gave so much as a dollar to the church. Oh, you'll remember used to be such a nice place as you drive by on your way to some other very comfortable church. But some of you, and in fact, looking out at the faces of those I know and love, pretty much all of you will stick around. Not out of some weird sense of false piety, but because you will walk into this place, you'll walk through that door right there, and you'll see the sea of diversity before you. People of all colors, ages, and creeds. You'll hear the rough language out by the coffee pot, and your eyes too will begin to tear up. Thank you, God, that they are here. Will be your prayer. You'll remember how it used to be around here, so nice. Ugh. And that word will begin to make your stomach churn just a little. You'll step through these doors and you'll see the faces, the people. Not numbers, not demographics, not gay, straight, black, white, poor, or rich. But your friends, your family, your church. The people that you love. People who are all at different place in their walks with God but yet are drawn to the pool of Bethesda, a place where people want to be well. You will see this happen. I believe it with everything that's in me that that, that is the future of Bethesda Covenant Church. And when you see it, I want you to remember this morning. I want you to remember that moment that the vision for Rockford Change from being this sort of nebulous vision for the church and it became a vision for you. I want you to remember that on Sunday, May 27th, the day of Pentecost, 2012, the Holy Spirit moved through you like wildfire. That you realize that God is not calling the church, but God is calling you the church. The question isn't, is there a need? Because we all know there's a need, right? The question isn't, could you do something about it? Because you and I both know you could do something about it. The question is, church, do you want to be well? Do you want to be a church that experiences miracles? 
Do you want to be a people who make their community a better place? Do you want to be a people who desperately seek God in prayer? Do you want to be a people who are consciously dependent upon the Holy Spirit? Do you want to be well, church? Do you want to be well, church? Does the covenant church, do you want to be well? Uh, One more time. Then get up and start walking. If you need some help, you want someone to brainstorm with or talk through your ideas with, I would love nothing more than to do that with you. And I have some other friends in this church that would love to do that with you. And I'll set you up with them, you know, Tuesdays, 10 o'clock, Megs, let's say. Uh, Just for instance, that could be a good time to do that sort of thing. Um, Every one of you is called and gifted for ministry. Every one of you in this room is called and gifted for ministry. Most people choose to stay on the sidelines of Bethesda. They want to sit near the healing waters and wait for an angel, some outreach committee to stir the waters, to meet the needs of those around them that they see. Most never receive healing from their lame lives. But you, O church, are being brought face to face with the God of creation. He's stooping down, reaching out his hand, and asking Bethesda Covenant Church, do you want to be well? Let's pray. God, I pray that your spirit would move through this place like wildfire. 